to gather some uh, thoughts really uh, on railway line plans and in particular the dimension which we're all interested in which is uh, the ordnance survey so really to have a have a look at the use that uh, railway companies made of ordnance materials um, i have to say from the very outset that um, i'm not uh, an expert on this i'm uh, an enthusiast I've been fortunate, as Jerry mentioned, in working uh, on the railways in their property side for a considerable length of time and have been able to uh, use these plans um, uh, constantly throughout uh, the earlier part of my work. And that was a real pleasure to me. Um, I started work, but uh, incidentally, in 1974 in the property office in Bristol. So my uh, Roll quite quickly took me into South Wales and dealing with the closed railway lines and um, we will have a look at one or two pieces from that area. Um, I thought perhaps though I should just start and tell you how I've sort of structured this a little bit around uh, the history of the railways, uh, not a great deal there because I think that probably the broad structure of what happened will be familiar to, to, to many. Um, and then uh, a little bit around uh, line plans themselves, their development, um, historically, um, both uh, before 1923 and after 1923, and I'll explain why that date is um, important in a moment or two. Um, then we'll have a look in a bit more detail at the Great Western Railway's work and uh, what they did in particular on the Teen Valley, the Cambrian and Corris Railways. And then just to cap it all off, if you're uh, interested in looking for further material, then there's a couple of sources that I'm aware of. But um, one thing I'm really hoping that we might get from this evening is a degree of interaction that uh, other people who may well know about this material uh, in more detail than I do will be able to share that and also share uh, perhaps other sources because one thing that struck me in the 40 odd years that I've been interested in this area is that it's a remarkably underused resource you very rarely see uh, line plans uh, published in books. In fact, I think I can only think of three off the top. Uh, one of those was a book that uh, published practically the whole line plan, which went to pages and pages, and the other two were just uh, it, by way of example. So it's an, it's an area that I've always found interesting, uh, and I would say that um, uh, it's a, as a, an enthusiast, uh, an enthusiast in maps and an enthusiast in railways that uh, I've put this uh, together tonight. So um, if we move uh, on then really into the first area, and uh, this is the um, only slide really dealing with railway history. And I just wanted to um, uh, set the scene really that up until 1922, um, railways were private companies. They'd been established by individual acts of parliament. Uh, in many cases, and we'll see an example later on under many acts of parliament required to uh, uh, construct uh, the railways. In 1923, there was a major exercise called the grouping, which produced four main railway companies, the, the LMS, that's the London, Midland and Scottish, the London Northeastern, the LNE, uh, the Southern Railway and the Great Western Railway. Out of the four, the Great Western Railway was distinguished in the sense that uh, the original Great Western Railway Company, founded in 1835, uh, continued in being, um, whereas the other three were entirely new creations. So that was a major event in 1923, the grouping. Um, just noting here that some of the smaller railway companies were not included in that exercise. Uh, for example, the Bishop's Castle Railway in Shropshire or certain narrow gauge lines uh, like the Festinyog and the Talathlin. And uh, those companies uh, were uh, left to their own devices in some respects. Um, uh, later in nationalization, some of these companies were included in um, the formation of the British Transport Commission. But uh, again, certain narrow gauge lines were left to one side. So the most important event so far as we're concerned uh, tonight is uh, really the grouping in 1923. As I said it was a major exercise uh, and it meant that literally new companies were created or for the Great Western Railway a significant number of companies were absorbed bringing with it uh, an increased uh, property portfolio with all the routes that uh, the railways had uh, created. Um, so if I perhaps go on to uh, 
um, talk about line plans themselves. And here I must, I think, start by saying that um, some of the terminology in this area is a little bit um, uh, possibly confusing, but maybe a little bit slack um, in the sense that um, these documents are referred to as line plans. Um, other companies talk about them as property plans. Um, I've heard them being referred to as terriers, um, estate plans. So there's, a, there's quite a wide range of uh, labels, if you like, for what is essentially uh, the same uh, document. Uh, and I, what I've just noted here, and I'll show you a few examples in a moment, is the way that different companies um, approached how they set out their property assets uh, on paper. Um, so the London Northeastern Railway, which uh, took over the Great Northern Railway amongst others, um, benefited from a, a very good range of finely detailed surveys. Um, the Great Eastern Railway, which also went into the LNER, used annotated ordnance survey plans, which was quite unusual amongst these pre-grouping companies. Um, but those ordnance plans were indexed in a particular way that, again, I think was unique to that company. I've not seen examples of it elsewhere. But the LNER, though, in 1923, decided to introduce large format ordnance plans, and we'll see an example of those formats in a minute. Um, the LMS, um, pretty much same story as the LNER, quite a mix, mixed bag of companies with um, uh, fine detailed surveys. So the Midland Railway, the London Northwestern Railway um, ha provided their surveys for the companies to use. Um, there was also um, a high degree in the LMS of newly bound ordnance survey annotated plans. And again, we'll look at one of those as, a, as an example. Um, the Southern Railway, um, quite a difficult area really, partly I think because uh, lots of records were lost in World War II and um, certainly from an estate perspective the quality of the records was uh, pretty poor in the end um, and you'll see there that there's reference to a major resurvey using aerial imagery for the first time in the 1950s and 60s and producing as a result a remarkably clear um, plan um, but um, with these are plans that were prepared uh, during British Railways days, and, and I won't be referring to those tonight because they don't directly relate back to ordnance products. Uh, and lastly, then the Great Western Railway, which is probably the lion's share of this chat tonight, uh, and I'll come on to those. So I thought perhaps um, we would uh, have a look at a few examples to start with and get a feel for what was going on. Um, so if we just go back pre-1923, so this is before the grouping, and um, perhaps the main point to make is that all material before the grouping was um, mapped at two chains to one inch. That uh, was a standard uh, approach uh, of practically all railway companies. Um, it was quite exceptional to have anything different. Um, there were individual station plans produced of um, the environs of stations at a larger scale, 40 feet to one inch. But uh, for the general line of route, it was all at two chains to one inch. Um, this is an example of a station at Yeat House in um, Cumbria now, or at that time, the county of Cumberland, you'll see it emblazoned across the top there. And um, this was a survey from 1881 of the London Northwest and Furness joint lines. Um, there was quite a dense network of lines uh, serving um, iron ore and other mineral deposits in land from um, the Cumbrian coast. And this was one of those routes. Um, what is quite interesting about this particular sheet is that um, you can probably just make out from the image that it's one complete sheet. And it measured about 27 inches by 41 inches. So made for a pretty hefty book of plans to refer to. And um, as a result, uh, I think it probably spent its entire life uh, in the drawing office and uh, uh, would not have been taken out to be used uh, 
on site, so to speak. Um, the station at Yeat House, uh, as a matter of interest, opened in 1874 and closed in uh, 1931, but goods traffic in the area continued for a, a time after that. Um, and I think you can see towards the bottom, if you look carefully, there is a branch line there, a former branch line, which the new route through Yeat House uh, um, superseded. Gavin, it's Jerry. Can I just uh, interrupt for a split second to say mm -hmm. that um, some people might not be aware that you can uh, zoom in on the slides which Gavin is showing. If you go to the button next to the green sign saying you are viewing Gavin John's screen, you'll see view options. If you pull down that menu, you will see zoom ratio and go to the right of it and you can enlarge it up to 300%. Oh, but, right. Uh, but okay. I recommend 150% as being useful. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, but... That's it, quite, no, that's fine. I, I don't think I can do that. I think everyone should be able to Everybody do else that. can, then. But yeah. I think if... Well, that's great. Yeah, so no, take the opportunity to scan around and pick out the detail, because some of these, uh, these surveys themselves are uh, remarkably detailed and uh, are worth doing. Uh, and there is an image a little bit later on, which I'll draw attention to some of the specifics. So um, yeah, it's certainly worth... Um, uh, so someone saying he can't seem to do that. Let me just reiterate, it's next to the green button, usually at the top of your screen on Zoom. Yeah. Uh, it says view options, uh, click on the little arrow and pull down the menu. And the top item usually is zoom ratio. Go across to your right. And instead of fit to window or 100%, make it 150 and you can zoom right in. And, okay. and without interfering with anyone else, you can move the picture about by clicking and dragging. Goodness. I'll, I'll shut up yeah. now. No, that's all right. That's fine. No, it's useful to know that. Um, so that's, that's one example um, up in the uh, Northwest, um, very large scale survey there prepared by the LMWR and Furnace Joint Lines. Um, the next example um, is from the Midland Railway. And um, I would say that this is from a, an uncolored version. Um, I don't have the colored version, unfortunately. Um, it's what I think the ordinance might have called an outline print. Um, but nevertheless, uh, because it lacks, if you like, the, the color and sometimes the clutter of all the annotations, it shows you quite clearly the survey that was uh, undertaken. Uh, this railway opened about 1894. So this survey is, um, probably within about 10 years of that date. Uh, and this is um, typical uh, Midland Railway survey, um, typical in the sense that it used uh, uh, standard um, annotations. Um, not typical though, in relation to quite a lot of other railways, because if you look very carefully, and I'm trying to find an example to show you, um, you see the station where it says South Witham Station, above that there are two platforms. The platform on the um, top side, I shall call it, towards the top of the screen, if you look at the letter M in platform, you'll see that there's a signal actually drawn there. Um, and that is quite unusual for um, railway companies to show the actual signaling arrangements. Um, but nevertheless, this is um, quite a, a clear example of a Midland Railway standard. Um, and if we move on just by way of example to the Great Western Railways Bristol and Exeter survey, the survey undertaken in 1884 and um, brought into service in 1887. Um, this is a section of railway line out of the three we've seen which is still open today. Um, although uh, the station at Hell and Bradninch um, closed in 1964. Um, what is interesting here is that if you can look carefully and use your zoom facility, you will see that um, the broad gauge rails are still laid on the main lines and on the sidings as well, which always intrigued me because when I started work in the Bristol office, the plans that were still in use even in 1974 were those for um, the Bristol and Exeter Railway showing broad gauge railway track and I just thought how amazing that was that uh, 
even at that stage. That was the latest version in use. <laughs> I'm sure they've been well superseded by now. But um, so it's so an interesting uh, plan from that perspective. Uh, and what you're starting to see here on this plan, and we'll come on to it later on, is the standard colouring that the Great Western Railway used. It preferred pink for land that it owned. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, a little bit later. Um, but that's um, quite a, a nice example of an early Great Western plan. And here's an example of a later one, which is for um, a station at Gilvach in South Wales. I put an inset map there from an old timetable and a big bold arrow to show you where we're talking about um, the rail network there. Pretty, uh, pretty dense, as you'll see in uh, a very uh, confined area. Uh, and Gilvach was a, a station which uh, enjoyed a passenger service um, for a fairly short period of time. It opened in 1881, um, closed in 1930, um, but there was still uh, coal traffic in the area into the late 1960s, um, as far as I know, um, before the local mines um, uh, closed completely. Um, but again, this is a development of the other plan we were looking at from the Great Western Railway, where um, pink is used to show what um, the company owned, and um, blue for railway tracks, yellow for platforms, um, red edging for title uh, boundaries, um, and that uh, the annotation for the title is shown um, in this example towards the top where it says Vaughan Hanning, Vaughan Lee, that's the person that sold or sold the uh, land to the company in 1878. And what you'll see next to that, uh, interestingly, is the number of the deed. So if you needed to see that document, you sent off a chit to the deed office at Paddington asking for 2148 and uh, that would be the document that you'd uh, get. Um, so there is quite a, um, a, I think this map is clearer, if you like, than the, uh, the previous version. Um, so there's a development there in terms of how the uh, maps were presenting. Um, but again, standard features appearing. So in the top left-hand corner, you've got a one and a quarter mile post mentioned. Um, and we'll see a little bit later on how this uh, color scheme was used after the grouping. So that section really was to give you a feel for what happened uh, with some companies, but also with the Great Western um, prior to the grouping. There is an awful lot of material that we could go through, but uh, I think uh, we need to be a little bit focused. Otherwise, we'll just get bogged down in uh, uh, looking at railway maps, which in itself wouldn't be a bad thing, but that's not the purpose of the talk tonight. <laughs> Um, so if we go on then to what happened after the grouping, so this was 1923, and uh, as I mentioned, um, a lot uh, happened in a very short period. Um, and for the Great Western Railway, it was a big task of integrating some 25 companies into um, the main company itself. Um, in fact, one of the comments that's usually leveled at the Great Western was that it standardized everything. And that's usually a comment made when uh, locomotives from pre-grouping companies, uh, you know, say the Taffdale Railway, were shipped off to Swindon and returned with a standard Great Western boiler. It's, uh, you know, it's generally regarded as, um, I don't think everybody saw it as, uh, as necessarily a good thing. Uh, so when your locomotive came back Swindonized, it was... Um, not not it was frowned on by some people um but in certain areas uh, the great western uh, set about standardizing um and land and line plans were one of those areas uh, and as we'll see at the moment um they generally uh, took quite a uh, solid and sound approach to that but again there were exceptions and there are some interesting examples of that around the cambrian railways in mid wales so even though they had a, an objective of standardization, they didn't necessarily always um, follow it through rigorously. Um, what's not clear to me, and it's one of these things that would be interesting really to find out, is um, how they prioritize which railways they would tackle first um, to produce these new line plans. Um, 
I suppose it is possible that um, the state of the company's records that they were taking over might have uh, caused them to think that uh, this one needs to be done before that one. Um, but what was quite clear was that it wasn't the economic or the operational input of the company to the Great Western Railway, because some of the busiest companies, um, for example, the Taff Vale, were one of the, some of the last to be done. Um, so I, one of those areas which um, perhaps with a bit more time and resource, uh, I would like to research, but um, if anybody's got any suggestions to make, then that would be really interesting to know about. So if we go on to have a look then perhaps at um, some of the examples that uh, were uh, around with um, post grouping companies. These are the covers of a pair of surveys that were created by the London, Midland and Scottish Railway. Um, this is for the, the one on the left is the Wick and Libster Light Railway and the one on the right is for the Black Isle Branch. And both of these railways uh, were on the Highland Railway, so north of Inverness. And um, this format you can see here, which is of a size about a foot across by 17 inches tall, was the standard format for the LMS and the London Northeastern Railway. Um, so a little bit smaller than the version we saw earlier, but certainly not particularly uh, portable if you wanted to make references to uh, uh, property items when you were out uh, on site. Um, so this is an example of the um, Black Isle Railway, which was a branch from Muir Ward to Fort Rose. And uh, here you can see the ordnance uh, products in use. And what has happened here is that a number of county sheets were purchased and then uh, dissected and then backed onto linen and then um, presented in the format in the cover that we've seen. You'll see towards the top, there are some pencil annotations saying Ross and Cromarty, and it's got a sheet reference of XC-2 and below it XC-6. So if you needed to, you could um, purchase that sheet. Um, but in this, uh, this format, the plan has been colored up to show um, the individual property areas that were purchased by um, lilac, orange, and other colors, and um, then subsequently annotated with cross red hatch to show how it was sold off. And, and I have, just so that you're aware, um, tried to obscure some of the disposal information because I, I just thought it probably wasn't my, my place to, uh, to publish that. Um, what's interesting here, if you look towards the left, sorry, the right hand side, um, it's actually hidden on my screen because of the drop down uh, images of people looking, but you can see that uh, they obviously decided to save a little bit of money and not purchase the uh, sheet immediately to the right because the property boundary comes down and then there's a little nib in where the corner of the uh, sheet would uh, have fitted in and have completed the picture. And that's quite unusual that because um, in my experience they did make a point of uh, completing these surveys as, as close as practicable. Um, <clears throat> And uh, just inset for your information is a photograph of the last train which ran in 1960. Uh, it was an excursion uh, carrying railway enthusiasts. Um, the passenger service had finished in 1951 and good services continued for about nine years after that. And this was the last train to uh, serve Fort Rose. Now, so that's an example of a London Midlands Scottish survey uh, that was introduced in 1926. Um, here's, by way of contrast, the London Northeastern Survey for Horncastle in uh, Lincolnshire. Um, by comparison, a pretty different product. Uh, and that's for two reasons. I think, firstly, their property interest is just shown by the pale green area. So it doesn't give you a detail in terms of different uh, parcels of land that were purchased. Um, but also the LNER's technique was to refer to everything by code numbers. So you consulted the plan, then you had to look up the code book to find out what the detail uh, uh, was behind that. Uh, and on this ordinance, uh, these ordinance sheets, uh, as you can see there, there's quite a distinctive um, 
color marking going diagonally across the um, uh, plan. Um, what the LNER did was to apply milepost information, so 130 miles appears to be stamped onto the face of the map, and then attach a label, and you can see the example there for Horncastle. Um, apart from that, there was very little customization directly on the map, but I think that's probably all to say there. Um, the railway at Horncastle closed uh, in 1954 to passengers and a little bit later to goods. Um, but it's uh, an example of how the LNER uh, approached this. So if we move on then perhaps now to the Great Western Railway, um, and some of these things I've, I've touched on. When we were looking at the earlier maps, I mentioned that um, there was a standard format and uh, colours that had been introduced and those colours that were developed in Victorian times and still used in Edwardian times uh, were continued forward to the work that they did in the grouping. Um, the most important aspects were showing uh, uh, mileages, property boundaries, titles, the structures uh, along the line. In other words, all fixed assets that the railway company owned. Um, the production was uh, what the Great Western term ordnance corrected and um, what that uh, implies is that you started with the latest version of the county series sheet, um, corrected it for changes on site um, and then had it produced uh, by lithography uh, standard sheet sizes and uh, and it ultimately ended up in a standard um, folded size, I should say. And that folded size was um, six inches by 12 inches, um, which made it actually quite a portable version and one which was uh, relatively easy to take out and uh, to use if you're looking at property. Um, and that's um, quite an interesting distinction to the other companies who didn't um, produce necessarily portable uh, uh, documents. Um, and the annotations, uh, as we've seen on some of these over time, gave uh, the plans, uh, you know, quite a, quite a distinct impression of the amount of use that had been put, uh, that, sorry, that they had been put to. And some of the ones that we will see a little bit later on are quite frankly getting quite cluttered, which um, uh, is interesting to see what, because historically what that tells you, but it's... Uh, if you're a bit of a purist and like to be able to see the plans, you kind of lose the uh, the, the way to do that. Um, and I've just noted their corrections because um, quite interestingly, there was an example in South Wales um, uh, where um, due to an oversight, I think that's the polite way to describe it, a section of operational railway line was sold. And uh, sometime later, this had to be corrected and a deed of rectification entered into to, uh, to change the disposal and to have the land revert back to the British Railways Board. That was a pretty rare event and I think it probably came about because of the um, complexity of the network in that particular location. And um, yeah, some embarrassment to my boss who uh, never quite lived that down. But, uh, so if we have a look at some of the Great Western material and I've divided this into um, three particular railways, so the Teen Valley first, and then the Cambrian Railways, and then uh, the Corris Railway. So um, just to briefly fill you in on the history of the Teen Valley Railway, uh, there's a map there again from a timetable, uh, and the um, point I just want to make in relation to the map is the blue bar, which is between Ashton and Cristo, because that was the boundary between the two railway companies that uh, uh, created this branch. So the branch line was just under 16 miles long and uh, as I noted there it took 43 years, two companies and 18 acts of parliament to build which is quite extraordinary really for uh, such a short section of line. Um, the first part, the Teen Valley part, opened in 1882 and that was from Heathfield up to uh, Ashton and Cristo and the Exeter Valley then opened, sorry, the Exeter Railway opened in 1903. So that completed the link from Exeter St. Thomas through to Cristo. Um, the actual boundary between the two railways just south of Cristo Station. Um, I didn't think to look actually, but I should have thought about looking as to how the 
railway actually worked prior to that date. But um, so it was a split uh, split uh, railway companies that uh, created this. It was worked by the Great Western Railway from the outset. Um, so if you'd used the railway, you would not have known that it wasn't actually owned by the Great Western Railway. Um, and so in 1922, two railway companies um, had a great old haggle with the Great Western Railway to uh, agree the terms to be taken over. Um, the line closed to passengers in 1958 and uh, the rest of it had closed the goods by 1968, with the exception of a very short section at the Exeter end, which we'll see on a map in a moment, which uh, remains uh, in situ today, although I'm not really too sure if there's any traffic passing at the moment. Um, so that's a little bit of the history, which uh, is for this railway. And there's a couple of photos here. Um, first one, as you'll see, there is at Heathfield, the junction for Chudley and the stations to Exeter. And this was taken in 1958. And the other photo at the bottom there is uh, at Christo Station, which is the boundary station between the two railway companies. And although this was an immensely rural area and has still got you know, such a strong and attractive feel today, um, you'll notice in the background there, there are numerous stone quarries around that um, brought uh, for some stations a bit of an industrial feel so it was quite a it was an interesting line from that perspective um, so quite early on um, I think this is around about 1924 the Great Western Railway um, produced some um, uh, line plans uh, this is the one for Exeter and the Teen Valley Railways and this was based on ordnance survey sheets from the county series uh, neatly segmented up in um, into one folding document. This is for Chudley Station, um, the site of which I'm afraid you'd be hard pressed to find today because I think it's underneath the Devon Expressway, whatever the uh, term for the main road between Exeter and Plymouth is. Um, so the withy beds that somebody has carefully uh, noted on the plan are now long gone, unfortunately. Um, and the fact that the engineer lets out the garden, um, I'm afraid they are uh, things of the past. Um, but it shows here the property owned by the company by pink colour. And in many respects is uh, simply a straightforward record of uh, um, what uh, the circumstances were prior to the production of a more formal land plan. Um, the next example is at the Exeter, Exeter end of the line, and this is where I mentioned that the um, track remains in situ for a part. Um, this does look quite complex, and those of you familiar with Exeter will probably uh, be fully aware of the complexity here, but um, running from the top left-hand corner right the way through to the bottom right-hand corner is the main line from Exeter to Plymouth, and that route is still open today as the main line. And again from the top left hand corner, um, running past the Mission Church and then dropping down to the centre of the image is the Teen Valley line and that section is uh, still there today for uh, freight traffic. Um, the other lines running up towards the north, uh, labelled Great Western Railway Basin Branch, have been uh, long removed. So this was the ordnance product starting to show the uh, land ownership of what would have been the Exeter Railway at this point. Um, and the next image is the Great Western Railway survey of 1927. Orientated, um, somewhat confusingly, I'm afraid, if you wanted to relate to the previous image uh, a, a little bit differently, but I wanted to show you the uh, size of the um, individual um, segments that the surveys presented in. So this is the six inch by 12 inch that I was referring to. Uh, and here you can see the application of the standard colour schemes, the pink for the land ownership, the blues, uh, yellows for platforms, um, one or two extra pieces coming in there because of the nature of property interests. Um, so there's a hatched, uh, hatched yellow appearing three times um, and hatched blue, which is for a disposal of land. Um, but again, this uh, gives you um, an idea of the bespoke work that comes out of this um, process that the Great Western Railway used. Um, these, this colouring is all hand coloured, 
Um, so you can see in there that the uh, sides of the embankments have been um, finely coloured in with a, a brown colour to give you a sense of the uh, relative height. Now the row at this point, you'll see where it crosses Alfrington Road is uh, uh, crossing the road on a bridge. So it's on a fairly high embankment and a run of arches actually off to the uh, right hand side. Um, so that's um, the first image really of the standard product that the Great Western Railway introduced for its companies um, that it acquired when it uh, was grouped. The most important thing I think is self-evident that um, is that this is at a scale of 1 to 2500. Um, so the railway has uh, moved away from the standard of two chains to one inch to 1 to 2500, occasioned I think because of the base material that was used to produce it. Um, So I thought perhaps um, before we go much further, um, we'll just slightly deviate, uh, only for a couple of slides, but to talk about one aspect of railway operation, which I can assure you has got some implications for mapping later on. So it's not all entirely without purpose. Um, and that was really just have a look at uh, how single lines of sections of railway are operated. And, and the cardinal principle here, which uh, I'm sure you'll be delighted to hear, is that there should only be one train in the section between uh, two signal boxes at a time. Um, so here are some images which uh, I put together. The first one showing uh, an example signal box at uh, Crookieth on North Wales on the Cambrian Railway. Uh, and within a signal box like that, although I have to say not in that particular signal box, uh, you would find tablet and token machines. Um, and that's an example of the machine. And these uh, machines, which should be located in signal boxes, would uh, talk to each other through electric or electric circuitry and would also be connected through to the signal levers, which you can just see on the right of the image. Um, provided uh, everything uh, went according to plan, the signalman would be able to retrieve a tablet from the machine. And you can see the signalman there in the last image with a pouch over his shoulder and the brass tablet uh, showing for that section of line. Um, so the images are Crookieth and North Wales, uh, a tablet machine on the southern from a, a location I don't know, I'm afraid, uh, and a signalman from a station in uh, Scotland. So the general principle, the way it was managed was um, uh, used across the, the uh, whole of the country by and large. Uh, and there are still parts of the national network that operate this way today, although it's fair to say they are relatively small in number. But a lot of heritage railways uh, preserve these methods of operation. And if you're interested, they can be quite fascinating to, to watch uh, in use. Um, just going on to the, the next slide, though, and it, it um, really was uh, something I read in the newspaper just over a month ago, which uh, sort of made me think that, that there was a, a potential linkage here. Um, just over 100 years ago, on the 26th of January 1921, there was a terrible accident uh, between Abba Mule and Newtown in mid Wales. And as you can see there, uh, 17 people were killed. Um, two trains uh, met head on on the single section of line between Abba Mule and Newtown. And this was uh, caused um, as the inquiry found, largely because of confused responsibilities by station staff at Abba Mule for handling the token which they'd received from the driver of the train that had arrived from Montgomery. Uh, and as a result, the train to go on to Newtown was dispatched with, with the wrong token um, and the collision ensued. Um, one of the other findings uh, I mentioned there was that um, the token machines, the tablet machines that were referred to on the other slide, should be moved to signal boxes and under the charge of signalmen, and that there should be electrical interlocking between the token machine and the section signal. So very typical, really, of the way that uh, our railways are developed. Um, regrettably, it, uh, it requires an incident like this to occur before further improvements are put in place. Um, and this uh, particular incident, uh, led to um, steam locomotives on the Cambrian section having um, entered into their cabs, uh, you know, some sort of uh, 
hand-painted lettering, check the tablet, remember Abbe Mule, as a reminder that um, drivers of trains should always ensure that they have the correct token for the section of line they're planning to travel over. Now that was a slight deviation from maps, I must admit, but nevertheless there's a, there is a relevance in a moment and we'll come to that when we have a look, uh, for example, at uh, Tawin Station. But if I can go on to uh, the Cambrian Railways um, and talk a little bit about that because um, uh, although I did mention earlier that the Great Western Railway favoured standardisation, even in a small network like this section, there was a great variety, so their objective uh, um, didn't quite uh, come out uh, uh, completely. Um, the Cambrian Railways, um, for those who may not be too familiar with them, um, operated uh, a section of route in Mid Wales. So if you like from uh, Oswestry on that section on the right hand side, um, down through Welshpool and Newtown and across to Machuntleth, where the lines split, uh, the south section going down to Aberystwyth and the northern section that went on up uh, around the coastline via Barmouth and around to Pulteli. And there were a number of additional branches, uh, for example, up to Dolgetli and Devil's Bridge, and a number of branches you can see there off the spine route. Uh, and quite interestingly, although the whole railway company was taken over by the Great Western in January 1922, and the Great Western Railway very promptly set about producing surveys and line plans for the main lines, so in se the section from Oversaw Street to Aberystwyth and then Dovey Junction to Portelli. Some of the branch lines um, got uh, indifferent treatment. Um, for the um, narrow gauge line to Tanvakarainian, for instance, uh, that had a um, completely new survey prepared. And uh, this was produced and issued in um, 1925. Um, the next railway, um, which I've shown there against number two, was the Van Railway, which was um, uh, a freight line. I think there was a very limited passenger service for a very short period in, uh, in Victorian times, but it was a freight line by this stage. That um, ended up with a, a rough tracing dated 1945. Um, so no proper plan prepared for that. Uh, the next railway up at number four, um, the Dinas Malvry branch, that uh, had to um, um, enjoy, if you like, the 1860 Act of Incorporation plan, so no survey showing any railway track was produced for that branch. Um, number three towards the bottom was the Vale of Rahidal line, which um, is arguably comparable to the other narrow gauge route, but that didn't have a survey completed until 1950. And just by way of reference, number five is the Corris Railway, which we'll come back to at the moment. So even quite a mixed bag in a very short, very small area of different approaches. But the main line, which is the uh, most interesting from our perspective, um, we'll look at a couple of examples here. The first one is at Tawin, and this is where I go back to what we were talking about um, a moment or two ago at Abba Mule. Well, one of the findings was that um, the signalling system needed uh, an overhaul, and the Great Western Railway very promptly set about um, upgrading signalling at a number of Cambrian railway stations. Uh, one of the advantages that they achieved here was that the two smaller boxes, which must have made it quite difficult to operate as a station, were um, controlled from one new signal box, the signal box in the photograph. Um, this signal box was relocated from uh, Maidenhead. Um, the Great Western did on occasion find new uses for old signal boxes and transported them around the network. Um, it was uh, so the signal box was relocated and uh, opened in July 1923. Um, and the line plan which was produced, of which this is the example, um, shows the new signal box. Um, so it's quite fresh and up to date. And uh, they've taken off the line plan the older signal boxes. Um, and what is interesting, I think, here is the way the Great Western Railway has customised the ordnance map. So it's added its own annotation for goods shared and cattle pens and signal boxes. Um, 
instead of signal post, it's for some reason chosen to use the uh, notation SIG for signal. Um, there have been siding alterations here. So if you were to look at the latest version of the um, Ordnance County series, which was dated 1900, 1901, you would see that um, there have been some track alterations. Um, number two on the map is showing you the Tauin terminus of the Talathlin railway. Um, and at that time that was called King's Station. And um, I think that's a reasonably fair representation of their track at the time. And what I think is also interesting here, you'll see the um, green hatching, which is land that was owned by the Cambrian Railways Company at some time, but is um, marked on this map as out of possession. Um, quite a significant area. I think, uh, if I recall rightly, Tauin was um, intended to be a bit of a seaside resort, and so there might have been some speculation here as to uh, what uh, potential might lie there locally and some land acquisition made. But um, anyway, by the time of this survey in 1923, it had been considerably reduced, uh, the land ownership to the pink section running across the image. Um, I think also it's worth just mentioning that I referred earlier to how these plans get um, overlaid with information. You'll see hordes of red notation here which is generally pretty tidy, it has to be said, but uh, it doesn't half make for quite a complex uh, piece of mapping. Um, so that's um, one example. Um, you'll notice there that somebody's obviously had an accident in the drawing office one day because Isandula Terrace has got a rather unattractive brown <laughs> splat across it. And when I was doing the research for this, I noticed a similar similar mark on a survey of a line at, of the station at Llyn Grill, which is a little bit further up the line. So somebody is possibly having quite a bad day. Um, but so that's uh, Tauin Station. Um, the next example um, at Porth Madog is uh, one that shows, again, in 1923, the uh, Welsh Highland Railway, which opened that summer at uh, Porth Madog and is running from the north, um, no, sorry, is running from the top right-hand corner down through the center of the map to point from point one to point two. Um, so the surveys picked up uh, very promptly and correctly the annotation there for Welsh Highland Railway. Um, it doesn't pick up for some reason on the new station, which was, uh, built at the same time around about point two. Whether that's because um, the Great Western Royal wasn't particularly interested in that because it isn't their property, um, I don't know. But um, it's a little bit of a surprising omission because elsewhere they do pick up uh, points of change. Um, so here, um, the coastline of the Cambrian Railways is running into Porth Maddock. You can just on the left-hand side see the start of Porth Maddock station. There's the footbridge there and the main road crossing, which is still in existence today. Uh, and of course, the Welsh Highland Railway has successfully been uh, reopened in uh, recent years. And the crossing, which you can see just above uh, number two has been reinstated and is now in regular use, or at least until, uh, at least uh, it will be when the co coronavirus allows trains to, uh, to start again. So um, that's an, an example of uh, immediate change that has been captured by this survey. This was uh, surveyed in 1923 in the Ordnance Correction in 1923, and the survey was brought into use in 1924. So, Great Western Railway got off the marks pretty smartish, really, with uh, some of these lines. Um, but as I mentioned, it would be interesting to know why they prioritise them in this way. Um, so if we move on perhaps to the last railway to have a look at, um, which is the Corris Railway. Um, interestingly, this is the very last acquisition by the Great Western Railway. They took over a bus company in Bristol, I think it was. Um, the bus company happened to own this railway, so the railway came with the acquisition of the bus company. Um, it was a narrow gauge line, primarily slate, but also other goods traffic and passengers at the time uh, into the valley north of Machantleth. 
And on the left hand side there, you can see the uh, line plan that was produced. This was um, a non standard product, both in size and the way that it, uh, uh, it used ordnance maps to show what property the railway, the railway owned. But um, I must admit, I'm quite a fan of the Chorus Railway, so it's quite nice to be able to uh, have a look at this document. And uh, I, just before I move on, I would say that you can see on the face of the survey there all the different labels that uh, the document itself has acquired over the years as, as railway history has uh, developed, if you like, um, in uh, rail track days, um, operational property went to rail track and non-operational property. For example, the Chorus Railway would have gone to Rail Property Limited. So um, the cover itself gives you a feel for the history of, uh, uh, of the railways. Um, so if we move on to an example um, from the uh, survey itself, um, this is based on Ordnance uh, County sheets. You'll see that um, the line itself, the property owned by the Chorus Railway and then the Great Western Railway are shown by pink. And then there has been some fairly heavy uh, annotation of um, various features, for example, occupational level crossings or stone culverts, uh, crossing keepers huts uh, along the route, and quite a detailed record in many respects of uh, some of the features. Um, you'll notice uh, quite interestingly, the company rents number 52, that's uh, one of the houses in the row at uh, Garnevwen, um, but no agreement. So I got, goodness knows on what terms they rent it, but um, no agreement could be found at that stage. Um, so it's quite a nice example of a customized ordnance survey product that uh, was used to make up the line plan for the Chorus Railway. Um, and again, an exception to the rule that uh, we, were, we were talking about uh, earlier on that uh, yet another line in the area covered by the Cambrian Railways had a different treatment. So um, uh, standardization didn't exactly uh, occur across the whole piece of the Great Western Railway. Um, and that's um, pretty much, I think, um, what I'd like to say in terms of the formal presentation. The, the last slide here was just uh, some references for further reading, if you're so minded. So there's an article in Sheet Lines 105, um, which um, expands in a little bit more detail on some of the things that we've been talking about. Uh, and there's also a book that was published in 1990 called Railway Surveyors that has got a chapter that talks about line plans and um, has got some images there from various line plans and on the cover on the on the um, enclosing uh, wrapper there is an example of a Great Western Railway line plan from Yeovil. So, um, so that's um, pretty much it from me really. Um, I don't know Jerry if you want to take over now and manage the Q&A. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Gavin that was a, a, a wonderful hour spent uh, zooming around the country Oh, speak. Awesome. and uh, our, our grateful thanks. There have been several uh, interesting questions posted oh dear. In, in chat, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I suspect there's a few uh, uh, other railway uh, gentlemen in the audience who oh, I hope so. I hope might so. want to say something and add something, uh, especially uh, uh, from the Lincolnshire direction, I think. But I'm going to take the questions in the order they came up. If you'd like to uh, uh, end sharing your screen Gavin let's uh, let's see you and everyone else and if anyone has any um, mm. uh, uh, other points to add I seem to have lost control of my oh, exit. Oh, just exit yeah oh there we are sorry well, if you'd like to close that yeah oh, here we are here we are all back again yeah. and um, oh, uh, I'm uh, <laughs> there's still 60 odd of us so uh, <laughs> Thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, it's, it's, it's customary these days to say, uh, if you enjoyed the talk, go to reactions and uh, give us a thumbs up or a, or a clap sign. If you want to ask a question, there is a, there is a, a, a bar under that now saying, raise your hand. Um, uh, David Andrews has just come in with another question. We'll add that uh, to what we've got. But if I can uh, uh, invite each of the members who's uh, posted a question on chat to uh, 
uh, give the question if you wish to. Uh, Graham James, are you there, Graham? If you, if you like, oh, I'm sorry, I, I need to. Um, I yep, need... I just need to work out which button to press to unmute and everything. Yes, I need to uh, uh, allow it to happen. Excuse me. Uh, I think if I just ask all. Um, oh, you you are you are uh, everyone's okay to unmute themselves. You can unmute by pressing Alt and A, or your space bar, or go to your picture and uh, click the blue, hover over the, the screen in the top right hand corner and it'll say unmute. <coughs> but sorry, Graham James, uh, would you like to put your own question, Graham? Yeah, thank you. Um, that was fascinating, thank you. On the yeah. heel and, oh, hell and, no, hail, I can never pronounce it right, heel and Brad Lynch map anyway, um, a couple of the annotations said, sold to Secretary of, Star Secretary of State for Transport and then gave what looks like a date in 1991. Mm. And maybe I'm completely misreading it and it's not a date in 1991. Um, because if it was, I assume that would be for the M5, which down in that way opened in the mid 1970s. So 1991 seems a bit late. So am I misreading it? And if not, does that, does that illustrate that these maps are actually in use as a real working document until very recently. Yes, I think broadly um, that that is right. Um, certainly, into the nineteen nineties and probably the early two thousands, um, these documents would have been in use. Um, they've been superseded now by very advanced uh, computer-based systems that um, uh, everybody can access uh, as they need. Um, and a large number of the documents have been placed in what's termed deep storage, whatever that means. Um, the interesting point you make there is that um, the motorway probably did open in the 1970s, um, but quite a large number of these complex land transactions with uh, the Ministry of Transport took years and years and years to complete. So they would, uh, they would issue a notice to take possession. They would take the land, they would do the construction, but tidying up the legalities wasn't a high priority. <laughs> um, so it probably is uh, something as pragmatic as that, that the transaction itself was not finished for, for many, many years afterwards. Got it. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Graham, and thank you, Gavin. I noticed as well, Gavin, that the uh, a couple of the Welsh maps, I think Toen was one of them, and... Uh, um, another one they were dated in the 70s and the 1970s and 1980s yeah. uh, as well so it'd be interesting to know yeah. where they've been till you got uh, your hands on them yeah anyway thank you for that um uh, rob wheeler uh, rob you you wanted to ask about uh, chudley yes um i just noticed that the the land ownership at chudley had a curious spur, as it, were, as it were, that seemed to head off from the line to the east, to get, go to a road and stop mm. with nothing in it. And I just wondered if that was uh, acquired because it was originally intended as the terminus of one of those two constituent railway companies. I, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I think I'd have to read my history on the Teen Valley Railway to see if that uh, can tell us. Um, what was quite interesting, I think if I remember, I can't really call the slide up now, um, I don't think that property was actually fenced off, so it was just the railway company saying it owned part of the farmer's field. Um, so I think that might be worth having a look up at and um, finding out what uh, the situation is. A little bit further up the line, um, there was a proposed branch line to Chagford. Um, which was a, going to be a light railway. And um, some acquisition was made of property for that. Uh, and that shows on the line plan for that right. uh, section. Um, so it, the piece you're referring to at Chudley is not unique in that sense. But as to what the reason for acquiring it was, I don't know at the moment. Right. Um, with, regard to the, with regard to that last question, um, the... the the the, leg, the legalities taking a long time is nothing new. Um, there was an ex, there was a, there is a type of map you sometimes encounter with uh, navigations, uh, where which uh, is known as um, where are maps of land cut and covered, which are essentially the uh, the lawyers sorting out what the uh, the company concerned had actually taken and uh, and agreeing the price mm. for it. 
yeah. long after it had actually been taken. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. You know, certainly, the, um, certainly the uh, transactions with the Ministry of Transport were uh, notoriously um, long-lived. Um, I, I noticed those 1980 annotations had BRB, uh, so it's British Railways Board's archive uh, yeah. that did something in the 1980s. But seeing Rob there in uh, sunny Lincolnshire uh, reminds me of your Horncastle map. It, uh, I couldn't help noticing, although it was uh, almost upside down, there was a, a site there. It said, site of Julian Bauer Maze. Does anyone know what that was about? It was a pretty big field. No, well, it's not. Well, well, I, I, <laughs> hello, yes, uh, I, can t I can add a little to that. Please um, do. Up at the, on, at the northern edge of the county, uh, by Alkborough, I think, uh, almost on the Humber, there is a maze that is also known as Julian's Bower. So uh, it's not unique at Horncastle, which is odd. The, the, the wording suggests that a Julian's Bower maze was uh, a, rec a recognised sort of maze, I can only suppose. Ah, oh, I was thinking that Bauer was his surname. Of course, that's that's uh, <laughs> it's probably a it's probably a Bauer of old. Thank you, Rob. Uh, not, not okay, may I interrupt for a moment? I have published an article about in the I think it's local history magazine, but it could be the historian about mazes, and this term, Julian Bauer, and references to Troy crop up all over the place. Uh -huh. on, on maps and it, it, it's part of a I don't think anybody entirely explains except that possibly it, it points back to um, uh, Knossos and the famous maze there thank you that was Trevor James thank you Trevor and uh, I, I shall change the subject back again to railways I think but uh, <laughs> amazing thank That's you interesting diversion um, uh, <laughs> the next question in chat was from David Keaton uh, about, or the comment really, about signal box tokens. Are you there, David? I am indeed, Jerry. Yes. Thanks, Gavin. It was an excellent presentation. It was just a point, really, just to flag up to you that the token blocks are still uh, maintained, you know, and, and remanufactured at the crew. You probably remember it as the service centre at Crew, which then morphed into National Railway Supplies that has now become oh, yes. Rail. Yeah. Uh, anyway, there's still a uh, struggle, I might add, because obviously some of these um, token blocks are 120 years old, but they still struggle to get spares. So there's a lot of can cannibalisation, but they're still being uh, maintained, mm -hmm. primarily up in Scotland. Um, but um, yeah, very, very interesting. And thanks again. Excellent presentation. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. Thank you for your comment, David. Uh, I'd, uh, and uh, I'm delighted to uh, welcome Michiel Rademarkers from the Netherlands, who's with us tonight. Nice to see you, Mike, Michiel. And uh, you you reckon that uh, Remember Abba Mule made it to India? Please explain. Well, I... I, I, I read this in a, in, an, um, in, an, in a magazine about... And it's interesting how the British railway practice uh, widely spread to all the British uh, dominions. And this, this uh, well, uh, warning was so essential to token block system that even Indian signal men had to remember it. <laughs> well, that's, that's a very interesting information. Anyone else got any colonial experience of it? Goodness <laughs> knows what they thought about the word amber mule. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I wonder how many how many Indian signal men uh, knew what Abermule, where Abermule was. They I'm only knew the, the accident. Yeah, I'm a volunteer signalman on the Swanage Railway, and one of the <laughs> um, one of the documents that you're asked to read as part of your training is uh, a standard work of reference on railway accidents, and uh, and in particular the chapter on Abermule because. Uh, it's very instructive how easy it is for people to get things wrong if uh, mm -hmm. the systems aren't safe and you don't concentrate. So, wasn't, wasn't there a near mishap, I think, on the Romney Highs and Dimchurch only a year or two back? Yes, there was. Over. Yeah. Basically, token misuse. Mm -hmm. 
But th there was a story I heard from, I think he was in the army out in India during the war. And um, being a railway enthusiast, went to look at the station. And the signalman was, or the station master, was very carefully explaining to him the token system. And I forget which, whose token system it was and how they could only get one token out at a time. And the following day, he popped out and all the tokens were out of the machine being polished. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Jeremy. That's, um, that's, uh, it's funny, but it shouldn't have been. I know. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you very much for that. The yes. next item in uh, chat, moving on, is from David Andrews. Are you there, David? Would you like to put your point about digitisation? Yes, I'm here, Jerry. Um, I assume that present-day railway line plans are all digitised, and I just wondered if there'd been any attempt to digitise the old plans as um, layers within the modern database. Um, when I was working for the railways, uh, and I finished about 12 years ago, uh, that was uh, just the plan that they were uh, developing and putting in. So they had um, created using ordnance data, the database, they'd put onto that uh, very basic property ownership uh, information, if you like, um, the equivalent of the pink color that we were looking at, looking at on some of the Great Western plans. And then they were going to add at a later date all this historical information. So they were going to scan in these old surveys and then um, map them across to the digital database. So it give you a very powerful tool, but um, if you like paper maps, then uh, you would lose the uh, tactile <laughs> benefit of using them. Um, but that, that I believe is what they have done. So they've got all the information uh, to hand and uh, in a system which you can, you know, zoom in and out and do whatever you wish. Um, I have got some examples of what that looks like. Um, perhaps it might have been interesting to have shown some of those to indicate where um, this has got to now. Would you like to show them later if, if you're able? Um, I, I'd have to scan them in first. Oh, I see. OK, OK. I just remind members that uh, a few years ago we had a splendid visit to York. Uh, not just the Railway Museum, but Network Rail's archive there, where they put on a, uh, an extremely good show, but they, they, uh, they have digitised just about every inch of track. Now, whether that's just photography or these plans as well, um, it makes you wonder if they actually need that data on a map anymore. They just dig down into the uh, digital records, I guess. But yeah, I think they take a uh, download of information from the ordinance mm -hmm. and um, use that under license. Okay, thank you. Moving on. Thank you, David. Um, the next question is, um, oh, from Rob again, uh, Rob Wheeler. Why did the Corris Railway land ownership extend scarcely further than the rails? I don't know. You'll have to ask the people that built the Corris Railway. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> maybe, maybe it was, a, it was a part of the fact that the Corus Railway was very poor. It may be that, yeah. It was, I think it was, it was, a, it was a rural line from nowhere to nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> it was originally opened as a, as, as a mineral railway. Um, so I suppose there was a sort of uh, yeah. I made the not. safety considerations that there are now about width and dimensions. And, can I say, actually, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, um, yeah. the Garneth one must be about the narrowest station that has ever been. <laughs> I think they, 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 the platform building is about four or five feet across. <laughs> but the, I mean, broadly, it was just bringing the slate down from Alasopheny, and then as they, they brought them in uh, Corris and, and uh, Breakhock at, at Corris, down to before the the Cambrian line down to the um, the Dovey and uh, I suspect because it was just at that point seems a, a purely mineral line they wanted the minimum amount of money because this was just a means of getting quarry down to port they weren't interested in uh, people or goods I would imagine other, other than the slate. I think that's uh, that sounds about right doesn't it that it was a well, horse-drawn tramway to start with. I'm, one, I'm wondering if my um, interpretation of the plan was wrong because it was being done on the basis of memory. Uh, I didn't, perhaps there was no land owned at all and it was all done by wayleaves. Is that possible? 
Um, no, I think I there were some references on that plan to uh, title deeds oh, of acquisition. Right. Yeah, yeah. Ger Jerry, uh, Jeremy Harrison again has a point about the Corris Railway too. Uh, he's trying to work out about house number yeah. 52. That, 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 that was an odd house that for some reason had ended up in railway ownership and mm. they were renting out. Because it seemed to be one of a terrace. Yes, uh, there is a terrace, yes. Uh, but, but why the railway had an interest in it, uh, who occupied it, whether it was the crossing keeper or the... Seems a bit grand to have a station master at that location, but uh, there must have been a need for it. Um, All right, I think, I think we'll bring the correspondence to a close mm. with that one. And uh, uh, Anne Taylor, are you, where are you, Anne? Are you have a question? Uh, no, you have a point to make about uh, Cambridge University Library. Are you still just, just to say that we've got a large collection of railway plans and um, related documents, some of them allegedly retrieved from a skip somewhere. Um, Sounds about so it. Please, please have a look at the catalogue. I've put hmm. the link up there. Yeah, thank you for that. Oh, yes, thanks. The uh, link to the catalogue is in chat. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Anne. And um, uh, oh, it's it's Jer Jeremy yeah. again. Yeah, it, 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 it was a comment I was going to make looking at the map of Fourth Maddox. Mm -hmm. the, the Welsh Highland Railway, as marked, did not go to BR and has ended up with the new Welsh Highland Railway. But the Welsh Highland Heritage Railway, which was the ori original outfit trying to rebuild the line, did get at ownership or occupancy at least of the, of the land which had been Cambrian was then Great Western Railway. And you could quite e clearly see it running out alongside the Welsh Island. Yes. Which is one of these things, <laughs> you know, it's just one of these things. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. The, uh, the, the two different narrow gauge railways uh, in Porth Maddock, the uh, Welsh Highland Railway that is managed by the Festiniog Railway, um, mm -hmm. didn't, I think, if I recall rightly, acquire any land that was formerly Cambrian, Great Western, or British no. Rail. It it, it 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 essentially had the original. When the Welsh Highland closed in during the war, the land ended, ended up in the hands of the receiver, who refused to sell it, other than as one block. And the Welsh Highland restoration people basically couldn't afford it, I think is the bottom line. When the Festiniog started their form of Welsh Highland project, they basically did a deal with the receiver and took the lot, I think is the summary. But the 1964 company, as it was sometimes known, had made a deal with BR to occupy the ex-Cambrian siding alongside the old Welsh Highland track bed. Yeah. yeah. It's... That seems okay. Uh, mm. Thank you. Thank you for that again, uh, Jeremy. Uh, did I see you waving, Mike? No. No. Okay. I am, the next point in chat is uh, from uh, Richard Oliver. I think that was just a comment on the terminus point made by Rob Wheeler, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I, think, I think we need to look at that and see if we can find out why that uh, land was... Um, it was, it, it was actually sprang out of the Corris Railway. It's a fairly general point about lines like the Corris Railway. They were built at minimal expense. Mm. And quite. A, and the characteristic of having the boundary fences hugging the track very closely is quite a common one on these lines. And they're quite often distinguished by a lack of any cuttings and embankments. So I don't myself find anything very odd about the way the Corris line is shown. The other point is that I think the um, gauge of the chorus was two foot or two foot three, and therefore the amount of um, land take would be pretty small anyway. And even mapping the 25 inch scale, that's going to mean an awful lot of lines very close together. Yeah. Well, well, two foot three. Yeah. Well, well, I've got two experts on there. Can uh, We were talking uh, earlier about uh, 
uh, two chains to the inch. Am I right that works out at 50 inch to the mile? A uh, 40 inch I made it. 40, is it? Yeah. Mm, thank you. Um, next up in chat is Stuart Hicks. Did you want to make uh, your comment, Stuart? Or shall I read it? Stuart Hicks, please. Stuart has written, a friend of mine worked for the British Rail Property Board until he retired early this century. Gosh, that sounds a long time ago. Doesn't it? Just, um, <laughs> I, and I believe that they still had a large collection of paper plans as evidence of title to parts of land. Fascinating talk. Thank you, says Stuart. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's a fair comment that uh, it was only with the introduction of this uh, uh, quite complex uh, computer system that, uh, you know, relies on ordnance data and then these layers of historical data that the paper collections have all been uh, retired yeah. to um, deep storage. And Rod Sladen has added Julian's Bauer seems to be a generic term for turf mazes. I didn't. That's interesting, that, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Um, Ann Taylor again has asked, was there only one copy of each map? Uh, no, there were a, a number of copies made. Um, in the Estates Department, there had been one copy that was held by the Deed Office at Paddington. There had been a copy held by the uh, head of the Estates Department, whose title varied over the years, and then a further copy held in the District Estate Office, of which there were uh, six or seven across for the whole of Great Western. Um, then on the civil engineers side, there were a number of other copies. Um, so there weren't, um, there weren't many copies. I would say we're probably talking about 10, 12, that sort of number of each map. Um, but now of course uh, it's um, all on the screen in front of you. So. Yeah, thank you for that, Gavin. Does anyone remember that wonderful uh, Charles Close Society visit? Uh, I think I think it was Charles Close. Forgive me. It was a, several decades ago to that wonderful so-called archive in the arches under Waterloo Station. Oh, no. There was a lovely glory hole, piles and piles of wonderful plans, uh, all needing to be uh, sorted and indexed. Hugh Craddock, are you with us now? Would you like to put your point, please, Hugh? I am. Thanks, Jerry, and and thank you, Gavin, for a, a, an excellent and very informative, fascinating presentation. Um, I think my f question follows on from Stuart's um, and Gavin, you referred, referred to these early contemporary plans being in deep storage. I wonder to what extent they might now be publicly accessible. And I speak having had a bit of a brush off from the, from the archives asking about such plans and being told they, they in effect don't hold such things. Um, I think Network Rail is an FOI body. I'm not entirely sure about that, but should one be able to expect to have copies of these plans disclosed if if they are held somewhere within the the Network Rail system? I think I'll have to sit on the fence there and say that's a matter for Network Rail. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. It's an interesting point because, um, as I said at the very start, I think there's a huge resource here which has is very, very rarely that you see a direct uh, reference uh, to. Um, and I think that's a great shame because there's a lot of very interesting material. But I, I do know that when I was using it, um, this material was treated as um, uh, confidential from a business perspective because of what it contained. And it was therefore not really to be uh, shared widely. And um, it was, you know, it was kept, kept private. Whether that's something that Network Rail um, still maintain, I think is probably something that they would have to decide. Um, but I do think um, it is a pity that there is uh, such a you know, wealth of material that um, I'm sure lots of people would find of interest. Um, it'd be nice to think it uh, could be made available. It's probably worth just reflecting on the fact that Network Rail will only have the material for lines that they own and operate. All the closed branch lines, um, on privatization in the early 90s went to the British Railways Board residuary body. So there's another group there somewhere who's also got uh, quite a significant archive. Um, but I, I really don't know the answer to whether these are uh, regarded as uh, documents that now should be public. Um, it would be safe to say though that they're not automatically being put in the archive even if, if they are being digitized. 
uh, as far as I know, all the hard copy material has been placed in um, archive, but whether that's accessible to the, let's call it the general public, the likes of you and me is a, is a, is a point really to put to, to Network Rare. Thank um, you. But, uh, you know, I, I have over the years um, acquired a, quite a large amount of material from my own, uh, uh, from the work that I've done. Um, usually because if I required a plan, I ordered two, one to use and one to keep. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a shame it's not of use because it uh, you know it shows at a point in time the state of the nation's railways. So. Thank you, uh, Hugh. Uh, there's lots. Oh, there's Caroline Watt looking amazingly like David Watt. Uh, would like to ask a question. Dave, well, I'd just like to like to make a comment. I do like Chris Harvey's Chris Harvey's cat, railway cat. Yes. Um, <clears throat> does does he she have a name? No, no it's fine. No, I quite like quite like to see the cat, and particularly where that she she poured at you when you stopped stroking her. Yeah, that's very good indeed. Anyway, I'm sorry, I, I thought I'd turn my camera off. <laughs> ah, well. Charlie, by the way. Oh, Charlie. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> does he have a question? No, nope. not really. When's tea? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, who who was last? Hugh, wasn't it? Uh, Michiel, I've got half a message from you here. I don't know if you wanted to ask anything further. I would like to ask to the to the, the in, a, in a remark to the, the fine present the fine presentation. I am very interested in railway mileages. Can you tell me whether the mileages on the Ordnance Survey maps are taken from the railway data or vice versa? Hmm. Railway mileages are probably worth a lecture in their own right, aren't they? I was um, afraid so. <laughs> Can I put in there? I, I think I try the, to measure them and often <laughs> they are quite wildly out of out all right. range. I from my experience, the mileage is the mileposts that you see indicated on ordnance maps, so yes, the that's series, are, are quite accurate and tie mm. across to the railway surveys. The interesting thing though, uh, well, depends on your perspective, of course. The interesting thing is the uh, source of the data point of uh, zero miles, and that varies widely. So if you go from uh, King's Cross to Edinburgh, I think you go through at least three different sets of mileages. Mm -hmm. So you never get to 400 miles from Edinburgh. But if you traveled on the Midland line from St. Pancras through to Carlisle, you would get past 300 miles on the milepost. And the same on the Great Western out to Fishguard and down to Penzance. But um, it was always quite interesting competition by an old friend of mine, David Lawrence, who some of you might know, was to identify 300 mile mile posts on the national network because because mm. the railway network was created in such small parts it's actually quite challenging on the west coast main line it's pretty much the same as the east coast at the mileage chops and changes and um, as you get north into the lancaster right, area because they, they used to they used to the original miles from the participating companies like the Lancaster and Carlisle, for instance. Yes, yeah. yeah. I'm sure as uh, Michiel uh, probably knows better than all of us, London Underground, as it now is, takes its zero <laughs> from Onga, which of course has long stopped being part of the Underground. The Central uh, Line. Uh, mm. uh, it was on the Central Line, yes. When I was a kid, I got the steam train out there. Rob Wheeler has a question. Yeah. May, I, may I interrupt on that point because there is a question lurking here, which I think is <laughs> quite important as an open question. And if anyone present has any thoughts on the matter, it will be very interesting to know what they are. And that concerns the, the mileages on the old series one inch uh, maps, which were added at a later stage of survey. That is to say, they do not appear on the earliest states. Now, recording it. The, the easiest so way of doing that through. would be to watch something else. I'll for... come to watch it without watching the adverts. Can, can you mute, please? Would have been for surveyors to have spotted the odd milepost erected by the company, marked those on the map, and then just measured the rest uh, on, on the map. 
Uh, is that what was done? It seems remarkable that a complete route survey should have been done by the Ordnance Surveyor merely to add mileposts. So, open question. Uh, Richard Oliver has a point to make on this. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind that railway mileages apparently um, were altered. I, I had this from uh, our late member David Milbank Chalice, who uh, I have no doubt who is still around will be in on this session. Around 1900, there was quite a lot of railway mileage alterations. And sometimes if you look even on first um, mid to late 1880s, first edition OS six inch mapping, you can see that quite different mileages were being used on some lines. For example, on the Midland line, um, west from Peterborough through Stamford, uh, compared with those which are familiar to us today. So I think some of the old series mileages were probably taken from uh, mile um, zeros, which um, ceased to, uh, have long since ceased to be used. Yes, it wasn't the mile zero I was interested in. It was how they were put in a particular spot. Uh, my, my assumption has always been that the OS surveyor basically saw something on the ground and said, oh, it said, and that's mile post. 100 and hmm. put that on the map. I think and that's when the railway remiled, re and it is a, a a later edition would have a new new mileage. Um, and it's an odd thing, which something I wonder about is why some lines for some railways got remiled and some didn't. I think the Midland did go through a big exercise in it. The southeastern and, and Chatham, or the southeastern, remiled everything when it got to Charing Cross to have miles from Charing Cross. But yes, thank you for that, Jeremy. Uh, Gavin, did you have anything to say, or can I invite uh, David Andrews to talk? Uh, David's got a point regarding mileages. Yeah, I, I, I've got nothing to add on that. It's, uh, it is an interesting area, though. But, um... yeah. David. Uh, yes, thanks, Jerry. Um, I can only speak from my personal experience of being an OS surveyor from 1964 till 2003 when I retired. Um, but I spent a fair lot of my time uh, walking along railways with or without flagmen, with or without orange fluorescent jackets, jumping out of the way when you heard a whistle. Um, in all that time, uh, when we were recasting the old county series onto the national grid 2500s, and the, the 1250s, the surveyor would just walk along the line and if he saw a mile post, he would plot it in its position and the mileage would be put on the map, whatever it said on the mile post. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you all for those contributions. I'd just like to yeah. say that we, we have some uh, uh, messages. Oh, sorry, uh, Andy? Andy's made the point. Uh, are you there, Andy? Andy's made the point that it uh, wasn't the de facto standard for mileages controlled by the railway clearing house up until 1948. I think the railway clearing house had, as it were, a set of mileages, for want of a better word, and knew what they were and how far places apart were. But those were figures that the railway companies supplied it with. Yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, probably right. They were looking after their own uh, tariffs as, as much as anything yeah. else, weren't they? Um, uh, goods. So, so something which we were, came up somewhere else was, there was a point between Farringdon and Snow Hill, and Holborn Viaduct low level in London, which was where the Metropolitan Railway ownership ended and the London Chatham and Dover Railway ownership started. And the RCH map merrily says that it's so many chains from the next station in one direction and so many chains the other way, but that, that was what the railway companies would have told it. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you for that again, Jeremy. I'd just yeah. like to say uh, Peter Yarlett has uh, thanked for a uh, excellent presentation. Uh, Gavin and um, several other people have said the same. Uh, Mike, I don't know Mike who, and uh, uh, Dave Waters said thank you. 
and has uh, left now. I think, uh, and uh, Paul Bishop, great talk and really informative, an area I knew la little about. Graham Collett, thanks for an excellent talk, Gavin. Um, Graham Collett, Swanage Railway Life Member from York. There we are. So thank you, uh, thank you all for those messages and thank you for your questions. Uh, I'm going to uh, draw it to an end now because it's uh, nine o'clock. Thank you very much and congratulations everyone on making it a record uh, size audience today. There were 60 of us at one time. And uh, Gavin, what can I say? That was uh, a tour de force. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, superbly presented. And um, uh, I think railways and ordnance survey and CCS is a magic combination. Thank you very much. Yes, let's uh, un you. unmute yourself and clap. <laughs> Excellent talk, Gavin. Thank you. Thank you. It's raised more questions than answers, hasn't it? Always. That's a good talk. It's, uh, it's quite good for you. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's very good. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, take care on the way home, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my stairs are quite treacherous. <laughs> yeah, good night. I'll see you on March. Bye. Twenty second. Sorry, I should say March twenty second. Uh, Richard Oliver is giving us a talk on the half inch uh, map with the research, the forthcoming book. Uh, so don't miss that. Same same time, same place, same channel. Thank you. <laughs> see you there. Good night. Good night. All right. Thank you.